as we begin all this, uh, just this morning, I got the newest Time magazine and they were talking about the UN's sustainable development goals targeting equality, poverty, health, growth, and sustainability. Will it be met or missed? Well, that's what we're going to kind of talk about today uh, and the theology <clears throat> behind it. Uh, does it meet? our gospel goals. Um, so that's what you can have in the back of your mind as we struggle with our technological abilities. How are we doing, Helen? Uh, almost there. Oh, good. Well done. Uh, it's, uh, it's got too big a picture, but I think you can read it, so. All right, well. Uh, can the New Deal be good news? Think of the good news. Uh, what is the good news message that God has for us? And uh, we're going to talk about uh, economics, the gospel, and the Green New Deal. And if you'll go to the next slide here, Helen. Uh, come on. <sighs> No, I don't need to learn more about Acrobat. Come on. Next slide. Oh, oh I've only got one here. Um, I didn't do the right if thing. If you click on two, does that do anything? Oh, I only saved the image of the first one. Let me go back here. Oh, technological fun. Isn't it lovely? <clears throat> John, is that downloaded to you? I'm working on that right now. I'm just I'm trying to see if I can figure out a way to do this that works for everybody. I may have just figured it out. Hold on a second here. Um, Fred, why don't you let me share the screen? Let me see if I can do it. I think I may have figured this out. You have figured it out? Uh, yeah, I have. I, I think I can do this. If you all let right. me share this here. Yeah, I made you a call host, so go ahead, John. Can you all see it now? Oh, yes. There it is. Yep. Now, can you go to no screen uh, slide number two? I can. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, as we know, John Harles, thank you, uh, is our adult forum facilitator or other titles. Uh, that I don't know of. And my name's Fred Miller. I'm a Canon pastor. And we have in the slide presentation snapshots of societal statements that you'll see many of. You'll see snapshots of biblical quotes. You'll see a snapshot of an Episcopal statement. And then we will have our panel, John, Helen, and Katie, uh, lead us uh, into a discussion. So let us begin with slide number three. Can we get slide number three? Oh, sorry. Here you go. There right, we go. This is the Green New Deal. This is uh, the, the very basics of the Green New Deal to use clean energy to build e the economy and create jobs, achieve 100% clean, renewable electricity. For all people of the United States, we wanna guarantee jobs with family sustaining wages, high quality healthcare, affordable, safe, and, and adequate housing. Slide four. A Republican-sponsored Green Real Deal in response, uh, Time Magazine reports, it calls for removing regulations that hinder advanced energy, investing in innovation, and encouraging voluntary reporting of greenhouse gas emissions, proposes a commitment to innovation as part of an effort to achieve robust economy-wide greenhouse gas emission reductions. Next slide. 
The Poor People's Campaign uh, ignited. Whoops. Whoop. Uh, ignited this past year. It's the poor are no longer ignored, dismissed, or pushed to the margins. These are the goals of the Poor People's Campaign. Systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, militarism, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism all be ended. And lie the lie of scarcity in the midst of abundance a new vision that says poverty can be abolished and change can come. And then we're missing a slide there, I guess. Black Lives Matter uh, is also something that has uh, erupted onto the scene. Uh, whose mission is, is it to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. We are an inclusive movement, firm all lives, working for a world uh, and affirm our humanity. Greta Thunberg, we've all seen uh, before the UN, emerged as a standard bearer in a generational battle an avatar of youth activists across the globe for fighting for everything from gun control to democratic representation. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions or drought and extreme poverty. The Paris Agreement is an international treaty on climate change. It was adopted in, by 196 parties in Paris on uh, 2015. Its goal is to limit global warming to well below two, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, to achieve this long-term temperature goal, countries aim to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. Next slide. Where does our environment fit in? Scripture says that there are basic, two basic commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do we blame God for our present problems of climate, COVID, climate destruction, and the economy? Well, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah uh, Jeremiah calls out and says, no one, no one cares. Um, Isaiah calls out and says, they have transgressed, violated, broken the covenant. Its inhabitants will suffer for their guilt. Um, and then that's from the prophets crying out against the people. And then we have uh, also, scripture, uh, from the beginning, God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was good. Uh, from the psalmist, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Uh, another psalm, you care for the land and, the, and water. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. And from Matthew's gospel, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Care for the world, care for the people. And then again from Matthew, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The Office of Government Relations from the Episcopal Church created these priorities in the next two slides. The first, creation care. The second, racial rec reconciliation. And there's uh, a lot of text there uh, to define it. So, uh, next slide. And here's the continuation of the priorities, ending poverty, 
immigration and refugees, human rights and peace building, the dignity and worth of all. And the next slide, discussion. Now we turn it over to our panelists. Take it away. Are you all on mute? <laughs> I'm happy to bat last. Uh, okay, I was about to say the same. So anyhow, okay. Katie Rupert. Or Katie, if you're up, up for it, go ahead. Okay, can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, because I don't know if all of you do, um, my name is Katie Ruth. I started attending um, so Stevens last year around May, I think, um, but I've mostly been virtual, so I don't think I've had the opportunity to meet all of you, but I'm glad to be with you here today. Um, I'm a student at United Lutheran Seminary um, in Philadelphia, and I'm pursuing my master's in public leadership. And one of the things that I'm interested about is climate justice. And so I've been talking with um, Pastor Fred and he invited me to come here and talk with you all today. Um, I guess my background, I've kind of been in religious um, movement organizations my entire life since I was born, um, but I was involved in a very conservative um, iteration of religion until just a few years ago. And so my, the way that I approach this issue is kind of, I guess, a little unconventional because I came from a background that really didn't even believe that climate change was a real thing. Um, and so the way that I kind of got introduced to the conversation about climate justice and talking about caring for the earth was actually through my other initiatives in social justice work, um, talking about working towards anti-oppression and towards a more caring world for each other, what it looks like to love our neighbor. And as I've kind of taken that journey, I realized that loving my neighbor um, and loving God also includes caring for the world that we live in. So that's a little bit about me and um, my interest in this topic. Can I get rid of the uh, slides uh, while we talk or is that- Yeah, we can do that. Just give me a second. Okay. Katie, did you have anything more to say? No, I'm good for now. Okay, Helen, you have something? Um, most of you know me. Um, for the few who don't, um, I've been kicking around the cathedral for a while and uh, various roles. I'm also a geologist. Um, although my geology professionally is pretty much applied geology for the ways in which geology interacts with humans, um, things like buildings and landslides and transportation and safety and so forth. Um, but I hang around with, with people who have made a lifelong study of cold regions and polar regions and rock glaciers and things like that. And there is zero question in my mind that we are experiencing real climate change. So unlike Katie's historical background, um, I'm coming from a long view that, yeah, this is real. Um, I've also been pretty much a tree hugger, although somewhat of a pragmatic one uh, since I can remember. Um, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s and, you know, we went through all of that stuff and many of you are old enough to remember those days and um, looking at the whole history of environmental regulation and laws and the Cuyahoga River catching fire and all of those things. So we have come a long way, but there's yet a long way to go. That said, I'm a scientist and I have studied a variety of things and there ain't no energy free lunch every energy source has both economic and environmental and social costs. Um, I have a colleague who grew up in Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania coal country, who absolutely hates windmills because to him, they desecrate the landscape and the mountains that he loves. Um, he seems to be perfectly happy with reclaimed coal mines and other aspects, um, but 
uh, you know, th th there are costs to everything. But I, I really am pleased that Fred chose to include Greta Thunberg in his slides because I think that she has been an icon of the future concerns of relatively young people. I'm 68. I got at best 10 or 20 years to do this and continue on things. Um, people in their 20s and younger and wherever have to live with this the whole rest of their lives. And, um, you know, I'd kind of like to see them have a decent world to live in. So you can argue all kinds of details and life is complicated and science is complicated and I'm not about to claim I understand all of the implications of every of one of the efforts to reduce climate change, but we got to get our asses in gear and get moving and doing something. So that's where I am. I'll be happy to comment more and answer questions and so forth, but I'll leave it for that for now. So, yeah. so um, I grew up uh, hunting and fishing with my dad in uh, Northern Wisconsin and Southern Ontario. Um, and um, got, I think, introduced to the environment in a pretty basic way. Um, I've seen the sun come up over magnificent lakes in Canada and uh, watch the reflection of the stars on lakes late at night um, that were perfectly still. And the magic of it never really left me. Uh, for the last, um, when, I, when I came to Pennsylvania, actually, in 1981 with Kathy, uh, to work at the what was then called the Department of Environmental Resources. Um, and I worked there for about 12 years and then went into teaching. Uh, and in the time that I spent teaching, or excuse me, at the Department of Environmental Resources, I worked on regulatory issues, uh, mining and, and waste and some in drinking water. And what I saw was is that you can't touch an environmental issue without having people being really in your face about the economic and job creation parts of this. There was just no way. And if you, if you had the idea that, oh my God, you know, we're gonna go out there and save the environment. We're gonna fight for that no matter what. Um, you run into all sorts of issues about, well, exactly how do you do this? What's the right way to protect the environment? And um, um, years ago, actually it was in 1992, um, I took off a week and went down to the UN Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro and got turned on to a concept that Fred alluded to um, called sustainable development. And the basic idea is that you protect the environment in a way <clears throat> um, that is also good for economic development, job creation, um, and, uh, um, um, and, and, and the like. You find a way, in other words, to make... <clears throat> environmental goals and social goals and economic goals work together. Uh, and I've been working on that pretty much uh, um, um, ever, ever since. Um, at the, and, and so um, I see the Green New Deal as a way of, uh, as sort of a, a, a wonderful branding of sustainable development, which people always told me was not um, all that, you know, sexy or exciting a term. Uh, but the Green New Deal for, has some sticking power. The problem with the Green New Deal, from, at least from the standpoint of some people, is how much of the social component do you bring into this? In other words, it's one thing to say, well, let's, let's find a way on climate change to, um, <clears throat> to address climate change in a way that builds the economy and creates jobs. That's one thing. It's a broader thing to say, well, let's also fight for these larger other issues, a guaranteed job for everybody, guaranteed housing for everybody and all the rest. And that makes it a bigger lift. And part of the reason the Green New Deal has become controversial, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's become controversial, but one of the reasons is the combination of the broader social agenda, the, the really, really big social agenda, which the country has never really fully embraced, certainly, um, with a comprehensive approach to climate change. And it's those, those two, it's the combination of those two things that, that makes the Green New Deal really quite a reach. Um, 
The other thing I'll just say quickly is that I'm glad to be part of this conversation because um, this is a continuation of a conversation that we've had for quite some time. I think um, I saw Jim Elliott in, on, on the call, Helen Delano uh, was part of our environmental stewardship committee back 20 years ago. Um, when we decided as a church, as a congregation, to make the school building a green project. And the, um, um, the, 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 the building, the, the, the very building that we would have been in but for COVID today <laughs> um, is a uh, building that is certified um, by the uh, uh, US Green Building Council. Um, I think we got a silver rating for leadership in environmental and energy design um, and so we've had this conversation. I think it's important that we continue this conversation um, just because of the, the importance of climate change. I'll just stop with one, one last thing to be somewhat provocative perhaps. Um, but I, was, um, I heard a presentation some years ago when I was um, at, at uh, um, um, Cambridge in the UK um, by a, a woman who talked about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and what happened over the course of, what happened to the German Lutheran church um, over the course of the 1930s was that it became um, more and more oriented toward Hitler and less and less oriented toward Christ. And Bonhoeffer said at one point, if we don't say no to this, we can't call ourselves Christian. And the question that she posed, and I'll just pose to the group, if you want to pick up on it, is if we don't say no to climate change, if we don't find a way to address this, given the enormous consequences to people all over the world, including people here, can we call ourselves Christian? And I'll just leave that question open. As usual, John has been organized and thoughtful and um, I commend your uh, summation, John. Thank you. We'd like to open it up to uh, those uh, present here. Uh, I have tried to uh, respond to John's controversy of the social aspect and uh, the climate change aspect with biblical quotes uh, and Jesus lifting up both, uh, but I open it up to the people present, your responses. Yeah. If I could follow up with Katie, I and mean, actually sort of uh, dovetails with what John is, and Fred are saying. I'm just curious, you said that you grew up in a, um, a faith tradition that, that sort of poo-pooed the idea of climate change, but obviously you've moved from that to a different position. I'm just curious, what that journey was like, how you navigated the, the transformation from a, a religious tradition, your tradition, which says this is not serious, to uh, one where now you, you're taking it very seriously. That's a great question. And it's something I think about a lot. And I think it's complicated and nuanced. Like there was a lot of different pieces to the puzzle. I do think that the biggest thing for me though was I, even though the religious tradition that I was in didn't take climate change seriously, I did want to take the Bible and my faith seriously. And so as I started moving out of that religious iteration of conservatism and into something else, I still wanted to keep the Bible and Jesus at the center of my faith expression. And so I started just asking questions about, well, what does that look like? Is there a way for me to move out of this conservative iteration of Christianity into something else? Um, and as I started asking those questions and reading and studying the Bible and learning more about theology, I realized that, um, well, I guess for me, I developed this kind of ethic of love at, at the center of the world as the way that God moves through the world and as a way that as something I want to live into as well. And so as I started thinking about that, um, social justice issues kind of came to the forefront. And so it started with, well, if I want to love my neighbor, they need to be housed and clothed and fed. And then it moved from that to, oh, well, there are like systems in place that stop people from getting access to those things. So if I want to love my neighbor, I need to care about that. And so then when I started thinking about that, then I started learning, well, climate change is this whole issue that actually 
undermines the entire process of what it means to have access to all these things. Mm -hmm. And so then I was like, well, I always believed that that wasn't real. So I need to do some research here and see what um, is ha happening. And for me, again, it was a case of, I really value and prioritize listening to communities. Um, that's part of my orientation. And so I was listening to these communities say, well, I don't have access to clean water and there's trash in my community that makes us all sick. And so my orientation towards climate change didn't start from like viewing numbers on a scale like the ocean temperature is rising as much as that's an important issue. It was more the people that I care about that God has asked me to love, they're suffering and I need to be part of moving towards change for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's powerful. Oh. Questions, comments? It's hard for me to understand the people that don't believe in climate change. Um, I'm not a scientist, but uh, it just seems so obvious. Um, and I don't know if there is a reason why um, Uh, there are things that happen that uh, they believe indicate that there is no climate change. Uh, it's just a mystery to me. There's um, one explanation that <clears throat> I'll throw out, Katie, um, and that is that what you've got in the United States and Australia and a couple of other countries is the fossil fuel industry and certain media networks are really well organized and well funded in terms of their um, um, that sort of attack on the science. And <clears throat> there's a really interesting book by Michael Mann, who's a climate scientist at Penn State. Um, and he describes this in quite some detail, a lot of which I already knew, but there was a larger pattern to it that I thought was interesting. And that is that what they've <clears throat> the, 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 it started out as just attack on the science and denying that climate change was occurring or could occur. And that's a harder argument to make these days because, you know, uh, January feels like March and so forth here. And a lot of people in different ways see climate changing all around them. Um, <clears throat> so now, now what they've done is they're sort of migrated to a, a different way of approaching it, which is to say, well, uh, actually, there are different ways. And one is to say, well, but it's everybody's fault because we all contribute or um, <clears throat> we're, we're doomed and therefore there's no point in doing anything. And this and various other arguments are all organized toward um, getting people confused about whether we ought to be doing anything at all from a political or social point of view um, and sort of <clears throat> stopping responsive action in its tracks. But I think if you if you go back to the origin of this, there's a great many countries that don't experience this at all. And that's because they don't have, quite frankly, Fox and Murdoch in the fossil fuel industry really pushing this so hard. And what is kind of surprising to me is people seem to be willing to believe the line from the fossil fuel industry, but they're not as willing to believe, which is absolutely for sure self-interested. And they don't what they don't seem to 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 get that that the the climate science people are far 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 more objective i think i think another component is that and i'm far from a sociologist so bob or somebody else can weigh in on this if i don't get it quite right but there is pretty well established work that people are willing to suspend their belief or disbelief when they perceive that an idea attacks their perception of their own well-being. And as John has touched on, media and, and interested parties have promoted uh, 
alternate facts that suggest that, um, you know, you're going to be, you know, there's stupid things, but, you know, you're going to lose your ability to do something. You're going to, your freedom to drive a big SUV is going to be taken away. You're, there's all kinds of stupid things, and I'm not coming up with, with better examples right now, but I suspect you've all seen them. And so it's easy when you feel threatened and there are information sources in our society right now that are promoting ideas that encourage people to feel threatened. And so it's easy to then identify the boogeyman, uh, the monster under the bed, the evil people uh, as, as false gods. So I guess I- so It's okay. an economic um, issue primarily. What was that Katie? Is it an economic issue primarily? I don't know. It depends on what people value. Some of it is economic. Not everyone is totally driven by economics. Some of it is, some of it is economic. It's oh, this is going to cost more, and it's going to you know drive you into whatever. But I think some of it is also perceptions of you know independence a, or something. It depends on the person. Is it? A, it's a control issue then, in a way. Yeah, probably yeah. independence to do what they want for some i'm sure that is yeah if i could speak to um the wealth component for a second too i think that um when someone has more wealth or more privilege it allows you to put a certain proximity between yourself and issues of climate change so like if i am if i have more money i can make my trash go further away from me I don't have to live in a place where I can't get rid of the trash that I'm creating. Um, I don't have to deal with the effects of not having clean water to drink because I can pay more to have access to water. Um, and so it really becomes the people who bear the brunt of climate change are those who are most vulnerable, oppressed and poor among us. Um, and so oftentimes it's people who have more wealth who are making policy decisions. And so it doesn't come to the forefront because you're not as affected by it. Um, but when you become more affected by it, you also don't have the resources then to actually do something about it, which is why listening to communities that are experiencing like the front, um, like the greatest effects of climate change need to come to the forefront of the conversation. Like um, there are 108 million people displaced every year by climate change related issues. Um, if we could have them as part of the conversation, I think that would start to change things rather than a conversation that just happens around theories and ideas, which are important too. We also need to talk about how our location sometimes stops us from being able to see the urgency of the issue. So in that sense, it is very much an economics issue, not just of how much do we spend, but our position economically stops us from actually understanding the full consequences of the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Katie is correct that, that the, the effects of climate change fall disproportionately on on many communities. Um, you know, we're sitting in in a reasonably good spot here in Pennsylvania. We're not going to be um, oppressively hot to the point of people dying of heat prostration in the summers. Immediately, we don't have an economy that depends on snow and ice. You know, we're, there are a variety of factors, but Anyone at, at the margins of the, of either the <clears throat> graphic and, and physical aspects, I mean, sea level rise is not going to hit us here in Pennsylvania, um, but it sure is if you're a Pacific Islander um, or you're living on uh, barrier islands off, off the southeastern part of the United States um, or New York City. Um, so there's disproportionate effects. Um, farmers are going to get hit. Um, in some ways, they may be allowed to, you know, it may be possible for them to grow different crops, but it's going to be a change from what they're used to and what our economy is set up and based on. Um, you know, I don't know how long it's going to be before we can grow cotton in Pennsylvania, but um, 
you know, that may come. Um, and where are we going to adjust? I work for, for DCNR, Conservation and Natural Resources, and we have a, a program that has been looking at how we should adapt our government management of public resources to climate change. And it's things like, you know, I think Bureau of Forestry is not going to put a whole lot more time and energy into trying to plant black cherry because the black cherry climate zone is moving north. Um, we've got insect pests in the forest management things. You know, they're not going to be building a lot more ski areas in state parks. They may work harder on swimming pools. So it's, it's those kinds of things that are adaptations. But all of those require resources and flexibility. Um, you know, if you cannot have the economic and social ability to move, you can't move away from things. If you are tied to your family structure and your economic structure and you know you you own a, you worked really really hard and you own a house in a zone where you're not going to be able to sell it for anything approaching what you paid for it you're trapped so <clears throat> there's a disproportionate effect that falls on people with limited resources in in any kind of ways i guess it's a cultural issue too yeah. uh, people that live on islands and subsist uh, and uh, have their own culture. Um, you don't want to move away from what you know. Right. I mean, you were going to say something. Christy. Yeah, something. I, I, I can't help thinking about the time that I've spent in Zambia. And when we were there, um, we were there three times, <laughs> a couple, like a month for three years. <laughs> And um, the biggest thing they were working on was water and uh, getting uh, the ability for people to have own water. And one of the problems is, was, and still continues to be from my understanding, is that the rainy season was getting shorter and the dry season was getting hotter and being able to produce crops, being able to have sustainable crops was becoming more and more of a concern and more of a, more of a problem. And so I think of developing countries or underdeveloped countries as, as being the ones that are truly short shifted um, in this idea of, of thinking about um, climate change and the environment and what it means. Yeah. John. I was just going to say, I saw Bob Coleman's hand go up in the corner, and some of you, us may have missed him. So I wonder if Bob can has a question for us. Or some thoughts. Um, I really like the evolution of this discussion. I think the issues are being well raised and well integrated. Uh, I think Katie's exposition of her transition from a relatively conservative stance to one grounded in the needs of communities and the people living within them with a theological background to it was mm. strong. I thank you for that. I really like the way you stated what you were stating and I respect your, your thought and your willingness to go so deeply into the implications of your thought. The more the discussion goes on, I'm coming to a position more strongly in favor of linking sustainable development and social issues than I had had earlier this morning as I was reading material on the Green New Deal. It strikes me as the way the discussion's going, I don't think you can pull the two apart for precisely the reasons that Helen and the folk from Zambia and Katie have been laying out, that the, the impact of climate change is disproportionately spread across and you can't meaningfully carry out sustainable development and the kinds of social changes that would be necessary in order to have the impact fully have effect for the people on the bottom 
unless you do in some meaningful way link social justice issues with sustainable development issues. The, the question is how to do that, obviously. And there's some controversy, as you may know, on the, on the term, the Green New Deal. The article in Wikipedia has a tag saying, no, there's argument that this article should be called the, I forget if they said American or United States New Deal. That, 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 that there's a green, green New Deal that needs to be crafted perhaps differently in different locations, in different nations in Africa, particularly in the uh, Southern Hemisphere. So anyway, I think linking justice issues and climate change issues is just bloody well necessary. And the issue is how to do it. And, and I think too, it is picking up on what Bob's talking about, what Christy did. I mean, this is of course a global issue. Um, the issue of climate change doesn't stop at national boundaries. And it does seem to me that there are a lot of people in the lesser economically developed or developing countries who say to us, well, you guys had your time. You were able to pollute with abandon and that helped your economic development. And now you're turning around and tell us we don't get to do that. It does seem to me that we have to have a response to that. That's not, well, it's a different time and those are the breaks. And I think also from a Christian perspective, there's, a, there's an issue here that's important for us to think about, which is that do we have moral obligations that extend beyond our national boundaries? Or, or do we have a stronger obligation, even including uh, environmental concerns to our fellow citizens? I, mean, I wonder what we think about that. Rouches, you had a comment, and then Amy. I, I have a, I had a friend who is, she would call herself a very strong evangelical Christian, who went by. Um, people were told to to subdue the earth, so it's our job, to kind of do what we want to do, and there's this sense of entitlement that I don't understand. And I, yes, that's a, because the one question a long time ago was how, yeah, what well, Katie Long says, how could anybody deny it? And it's, and, and sort of building on what John Dernbach said that um, <clears throat> part of the problem, well, actually several people, part of the problem is, first of all, that they, um, the thing is, it's not that climate isn't changing. That's pretty much, even my very, very concern, I'm taking this from my conservative friends, my Wednesday morning prayer group there. Um, they believe in climate change. It's just that it's not caused by man. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the issue. Is it caused by man or is it a natural part of, of, of what's going on with, with the world as in experience climate change, you know, uh, maybe more. And the point is that it's not caused by man. And that's one of the issues. They're not denying climate change. They just believe it's caused by man. The second thing is that somebody mentioned about the things being economic and, and some of it being economic. I think almost all of it is economic or at least personal freedom slash sacrifice mm -hmm. if we are going to conquer this it will cause it will require sacrifice in our part and um they don't nobody wants to do that okay i think also that the the christians have the conservative christians have been following the republican party they follow the republican party it's not the other way around and uh i and i and that they are the one i don't know why but they seem to be in bed with the big uh energy industries mm -hmm. okay and building what my wife just said too about, they think that uh, that we're told we were our command is to subdue the earth. God will handle it if we just obey God and subdue the earth. Mm -hmm. God will take care of it. Okay. And lastly, I would this I just want to say that it seems to be that Katie Ruthing is grounded is grounded not in anything but grounded in in Jesus and the Bible. That is the ground, and and I would. Like to see that to be the, the the ground upon which we build stuff, not on our understanding of climate issues and, and politics and and our our understanding of anything, but grounded on Jesus and maybe one thing, our understanding of God's love for us. I have one comment that I'll make um, to the folks who recognize that the climate is changing but don't have. Uh, 
agreement on, on causes. Um, yes, the climate has historically, to geologic time, changed, <laughs> but it has done so as far as we know, and there's lots of new research coming out about rates of change and so forth, but the, the thing that is striking now is the rate at which it's changing. Um, we're changing orders of magnitude faster than we think the climate changed at other times, barring things like a huge meteorite impact, which put the earth into a, you know, no sunshine through the clouds of, of dust for, for a couple of years kind of thing which killed off all the dinosaurs. Um, you know, there's a difference between the earth surviving. I, I, I sort of marvel and I understand where it comes from, but I always marvel at the people who say, we are destroying the earth. You know, the planet <laughs> is a whole lot tougher than we are. We may be destroying humanity and other organisms that we depend upon, but you know, we ain't going to destroy the earth. It may not be livable for us, but that's a different question. And so, um, yeah, th there are the small number of legitimate scientists I know who argue about aspects of climate change may argue about the causes, but I'm pretty convinced when you start looking at the records and, you know, you look at the industrial revolution and the timing and the amount of carbon dioxide and methane put into the air, et cetera. So I'm not gonna bore you with the details there, but your points are really good um, that this is the origins of, of some people's resistance. And it doesn't matter that we can sit there and say, you're wrong. We need to work in different ways to say, what can we join it? And back in the early days of, you know, green energy and so forth, we took the approach of, well, you know, even if it doesn't work, make a difference for climate change, even if climate change is not the issue, you can save money by converting to fluorescent light bulbs and whatever. Well, we're 20 years past that now, but the same principle holds that there are still other good reasons to do this, even if it's not that. So, and it doesn't cost that much to do it and if we're wrong, we're still gaining in other directions. So that's a, an alternate view to take that way to spread the argument. I think Amy had those next with her hand up and then I'll shut up for a while. I'm, um, I'm interested in the mechanism that would enable us to inspire or facilitate a change of mind from um, self-interest whether it be individual or national or corporate, to um, a mindset of mutual interest in other people, which I suppose is a secular way of saying, how do we love our neighbors as ourselves? And the reason I'm, I'm asking that is I remember in about 1980, in the ancient times when I was still in grad school and working as a waitress at night, that restaurants and bars were loaded with tobacco smoke. And the um, personal self-interest of those who smoked was considered almost sacrosanct. Remember those days? And do you remember like now, or perhaps I should say a year ago, when we were allowed to gather in restaurants and so on, um, there is not the, like the smoker's rights thing is a, it's gone. It's, it's no longer supported by the lies of the tobacco industry. Is that too harsh a word? Um, saying that smoking was not really harmful. Remember that? Remember all that pseudoscience that was published? And we have moved to it. So we've moved to a different frame of mind. And I'm wondering how we as people of faith can exercise um, our understanding of our responsibility to other people, a life of mutual accountability to facilitate this change toward respecting other people's right to continue living without drowning or burning or starving. And 
it's got to go beyond my individual desire to drive a Prius or whatever. Um, it really needs to be grounded in something far more profound. So, and that's all I have to say about that. I, I agree with the understanding that as people of faith, we have a different way of, of explaining this, but we could facilitate this change of mind, I hope. Oh, well, we're not smoking yeah. anymore. This is Noel Potter sitting around the corner from Helen. You probably know I'm another geologist and I like the long-term view. And something I haven't heard much of this morning, and that might help with Amy's uh, question a bit, is to ask, um, what am I going to leave for my grandchildren, for example? Grandchildren are not far enough away that we can uh, not imagine them. Uh, will the world be different for them? Um, I find myself thinking every so often as I'm driving, um, what will driving and getting around be like in 40 years? I think it's going to change a lot, but I would like to think, let me, let me just end by saying, I would like to think that my grandchildren could go see some of the undisturbed areas of the world that are left uh, when they're old enough to do it. I'll leave it there. You can imagine. Transportation changes for all of us. I know uh, my daughter lives in Brooklyn. She has no car. She gets everywhere by train. Uh, bus or Uber. <laughs> so uh, that's okay. probably going to be more and more what's going to happen for all of us. And that will mean always walking too. <laughs> always walking. That will mean that I can't live 12 miles from the nearest grocery store um, if I don't have independent transportation. Um, Scott. So I think I think one of the things um, to focus on is 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 probably the hardest part of all of this, and that is how to meet people who uh, are, uh, as they say, poo pooing climate change, um, who believe that every bit of everything is in God's hands, thereby abdicating them of responsibility for what's going on. I think the hardest part is to meet those people and their fears and, and the ones who, um, who, who don't have God in the picture at all, who simply don't care. You know, we've got people that just don't care and nothing that, we, and I honestly think that not much we can say um, can make them care as much as we would like them to do so so I'm as I'm listening to this the thing I keep distilling it down to um, is um, a thoughts and prayers kind of a thing um, I, I, I really believe that keeping this in our prayers and and trying our best to meet somebody where they are is is key um, you know when somebody says Oh, God is handling it. I'll jump right in and say, and thank goodness, God is handling it. And this is where I see my part in that. What about you? You know, to, to pull away the defenses rather than build them up and, and come back with my reaction. But how do, how do I truly respond to those people in a loving way that lets them know that I see them? And, and just doing what I can to open up the path to conversation. You have brought the social aspect and the social necessity of uh, this whole issue uh, to the forefront. Uh, we are out of time, but uh, Scott, do you have something brief to say? It's very brief. Uh, it was from that documentary I recently saw called Death to 2020. <laughs> and they had Greta, and if anybody's seen it, you know, they're giggling right now. So um, 
and, and Greta Thunberg's remark to the people of Davos, which was, act as though you love your children. Very good. Well, thank you all. John, do you have something to say about next week? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for a great discussion. And thanks to Fred and to John, Katie, and Helen for, for helping to spearhead it. Uh, next week, Linda Goldstein is going to do a presentation about how the performing arts can really be an, um, a vehicle for a moral discussion and moral change, especially about issues of race, I think. So uh, come back for that. And have a wonderful week. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Thank oh. you.